welcome everybody thank you for joining us here tonight um as Rob said, there's some amazing guests. I can't wait to ask them the questions um, that I've developed. I also can't wait to hear the questions that you've got for them as well. And just generally, this is, I just feel like I'm going to learn a lot. I'm going to sort of hear some really interesting stories and I can't wait. And um, one person uh, that I'm really excited to talk to, um, I'm going to fangirl a little bit here, Isla, um, because I've wanted to talk to you for ages. So I'm super excited uh, that you are our first uh, first guest up tonight. Um, Isla, just to start us off, for, for people who are watching who, you know, sort of may, you know, sort of into bikes, but maybe not, don't know sort of like this end of the process, how would you define what what bike design is? What What is bike design? When we say bike design, what do we mean? The easy question to start with there. <laughs> <laughs> straight in there. <laughs> yeah, straight in there. The bicycle's already been invented. Yeah. That's not what we do. But um, Neil, Dom and I um, are taking that concept and designing a version of it for a particular user and usage. Um, and that would include their physical characteristics um, and where they're going to ride it. Um, and we, I think we generally break it down into this, the frame. Um, so that will be um, designing the frame in terms of shape, that's fit, and then um, the materials and the way those materials are manipulated, tube diameters, wall thicknesses, and, 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 and colours. We will be responsible for um, either designing or sourcing the graphics for those and the colours. And then we would also be um, doing the part specification. Um, so that's choosing all the parts. And that makes it sound like quite a dry process, but what um, all of us are aiming to do is to make that work holistically as a whole for the person that we've got in mind that's going to be riding that in the way that they um, might be going to ride it. Excellent. Well, we're going to hear three different perspectives on 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 how to approach that. Um, so let's start off with you, Isla. But let's let's backtrack a bit. How did you get into bike design? So what's your story, your journey? into into designing bikes and the particular niche that you designed for that we've alluded to already like most people it wasn't planned um, <laughs> i think there's various threads to it my father was an industrial designer would be called a product designer uh, today by trade and he qualified in the early 1960s so design was very much a part of my childhood and he involved me in his work um, and i think that exposed me to the process and subliminal learning really um, around design and as I as I grew up I got into bikes I joined yeah. bike, I was into bikes really from very tiny for it was a lo love from the first pedal stroke on my fourth birthday but um, I joined a cycling club when I was 12 I was always fiddling with bikes at home in the garage curious um, and worked started working a bike shop when I was 16 and then as I um, went into adulthood and my racing got more serious, I became frustrated with the limitations of the bikes that I was using, particularly because I'm physically small. It's difficult to tell on a Zoom, uh, a Zoom call, but um, I'm not very big and my hands aren't very big. And that, that um, led me into trying to solve problems for myself initially. Um, I learned how to build frames in my very early 20s. Um, and actually was manufacturing bikes, both custom bikes and trailer bikes for children throughout my 20s. And it just it, it just grew from there. Um, yeah, that's how I got into it. And we've had a couple of um, comments already with people saying like, I, was, I think I just saw Gavin pop up that said all his kids ride Isla bikes. And as Dom mentioned, I mean, when we're talking about really good bikes for children, the name that comes up is Isla bikes. Um, what when you uh, where did that idea come from was an extension of your experiences where was the idea to focus initially anyway on on developing really good bikes for kids um i i, I got to i started isla bikes i think it was 15 16 years ago mm. and and in the run-up to that decision to take that leap um i'd got to an age where my friends my sister and my close friends were having children and everybody I suspect that's um, on this call this evening will um, know that um, when somebody wants to buy a bicycle, you're the enthusiast cyclist, so they ask you for advice. And so they were asking me what to get for their children. And it particularly drew my focus to that part of the market. And the bikes at that point in time for children were pretty much universally terrible. 
and um, I didn't want the children of my nearest and dearest to have what I considered to be a really poor experience of cycling so they were really really heavy I mean heavier than any of the bikes that probably any of us ride as adults even for a four or five year old um, they um, in particular would have very unsuitable sized components brakes that were out of reach where the, the springs are too heavy to pull on adult length cranks and then quite a lot of um, um, non-functional tat <laughs> attached to the, whether that was tassels or um, Bob the Builder or whatever. <coughs> and I felt that I felt that they were so poor that they would put had potential to put children off cycling in some cases. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was thinking about my young relatives, I thought, no, I don't want that because I'm an evangelist for cycling. You want the people you love to appreciate or love the things that you love. And, and then I thought, well, this actually applies to all children. And that was the spark of the idea. And I felt that because I'm physically small and had felt the benefits of modifying um, bicycles for myself mm -hmm. and felt that the confidence boost that comes from knowing that you can stop for example I mean it sounds really straightforward but I felt that I could extrapolate that to um, what it might feel like for a four five eight year old um, riding the bikes that were available at that time um, and so I, I applied that personal experience to their situation really and that's where it started from. So if you were so when you when you sort of went into it like okay I'm gonna design bikes for kids you've sort of mentioned some of the things that you've thought about there. So how, how, what are the main considerations? So you've got weights, you've got good brakes, and how do you build that into the design? And were you able to find components to realize your vision? Uh, not, at, not at the point in time that I started the business. Um, um, yeah, components were a big, big constraint. Um, Initially, um, I actually designed some components right from the very outset, and that was quite a leap of faith and investment. And then really ever since, we've, we've reinvested profits from the business to design more and more components that suit the physical size of children. Um, but yeah, the key, the key points that you mentioned at the beginning of the question are, um, yeah, make the weight appropriate to the um, weight of the rider. It doesn't need to be strong enough for somebody who's 15 stone if it's for a, uh, for a six year old. Um, and um, make sure that um, everything fits properly. It sounds really simple, but it's actually quite hard to achieve. Um, you've got um, some limiting factors with standard bicycle components, for instance, bottom bracket width, um, that, that mean that um, you're, you're trying to squeeze millimeters out here and there to get the effect that you want. Um, and then just making sure that everything actually works well. So there was a quality thing as well at the time that I launched the business. And it's it's gone away with lots, and there's lots of brands doing really nice children's bikes now outside Isle of Bikes. Um, but at the time, I think it's easy for us to forget that just how recently it was, you, 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 couldn't, you couldn't service these things. You know, they just, they, they, they were almost some of them, a lot of them almost unusable. Yeah, I remember working in an Evan Cycles and we'd have parents come in sometimes <coughs> and we're like, well, I don't think I can even get like a pump valve on the valve of the tire to inflate the tires at this point. Well, access Never it, mind. Yeah. yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. it was, it was interesting. Um, so this, this sort of market wasn't really, well, the market was there, but the product wasn't really there. The segment wasn't there. So when you like, when you came up with this idea, what kind of reactions did you get from people? Where they're like, oh yeah, that sounds great. Or did you have more like, oh, I'm not sure, like people gonna go for this? The parents gonna invest in these kind of bikes? I think the industry reaction was you're mad. Um, <laughs> friends in the industry. We, we, we launched, the, 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 a bike for a four year old when we launched the business or when I launched the business and it was just me to start with. Um, um, the, the most expensive bike for a four-year-old in the marketplace was about 50 pounds. And when we launched, um, our four-year-old bike was 100 pounds. So it was double the next priced bicycle in the market at the time. So that is quite a big leap of faith. Um, and certainly within the industry, there's a feeling that, that people just wouldn't pay that much money. They were really uh, considered a disposable toy item for a lot of people. Um, it was when I actually spoke to families, uh, that, and particularly enthusiastic cycling families who got an appreciation of the product and they've seen their children 
struggling with them um, and they were much more positive and that encouraged me at the time. And were you surprised at how much it took off or you know were you what did it feel like when when suddenly well not suddenly because you worked hard and you had to grow it but like when people go oh yeah Isla bikes great bike for kids you know so people are like desperately trying to find them like every you know people who are into cycling want Isla bikes for their kids how you know did how did it feel to kind of prove the naysayers wrong um I look back on the time of the conception of the business and then working to launch it and the first the first couple of two or three years and I, and I wonder who that person was that did <laughs> um I was absolutely sure it would work I had a an almost conceited convic conviction in that this was going to work um I don't think I ever envisaged the scale that it grew to yeah um and that um you know in 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 the later years sort of years five onwards but uh, those, those uh, yeah that, that market I was absolutely convinced it was there um so yeah it was. <laughs> it was but now I sort of you like like lots of people you know I'm riddled with doubts about all sorts of different things and I look back on that time and it's it's like a particular psychological state that I was in um yeah. that, that really enabled me to take that risk I think I yeah. recognize that totally Ah, there. Dom's got to show this. We'll, we'll ask you about that as well, I think, Dom, in, in, in oh, just God. a moment. <laughs> Don't worry, Dom, there's no escaping here. Um, so, Isla, another thing that's sort of very much built into, into Isla Bikes is this sort of idea um, you're moving towards of um, the environmental impact of bikes and sort of a circular economy because, and it's something that we, everybody's more and more aware of now and particularly when we're talking about bikes because actually a lot of resources go into bikes like we're talking about bikes made of metal there's extraction and processing that goes on with that we've got all of the parts and there were calls recently as well um to produce uh, you know so for, for for bigger bike brands to stop producing i guess disposable componentry that can't be fixed um how is that something that was always sort of key to what you wanted Isla Bikes to do and, and how what are the challenges of incorporating that into the design of a bike? Um, it's a big question. Um, when I launched the business my entire focus was around making a better cycling experience for children. Um, sustainability wasn't really on my radar. I think the cycle industry um, we, we make a product that makes transport very very low impact in terms of the environment but the way in which we make it we're not addressing the things that we need to address as, a, as an industry at the moment um, and I include Isla Bikes within that um, there's much more we can do we did an experimental project which I think we started about four years ago ish um, called the Imagine Project where we <coughs> um, attempted to make bicycles in a, a circular economy way and what that's about is that um, the traditional um, way of making any any consumer product is taking raw materials usually virgin raw, raw materials out the ground making them into a product it's used for a period of time and then disposed of um, the circular economy concept is about taking making the product out of materials that have already been extracted so they've either been recycled or they're waste from another industry turning into your product making that product last as long as possible so you design for longevity and then at the end of life, being able to separate and reuse all the raw materials. Um, and we we spent actually several years and a lot of money developing, designing um, a circular economy bike. And the key part of that is actually that it's rented. It's a subscription model rather than an outright purchase model. And that gives the leaves the responsibility with the manufacturer or the brand rather than the consumer for what happens at end of life and for maintaining that and making it last as long as possible. And it also incentivizes the, um, the brands to design for longevity because you make money, more money, the longer it lasts rather than make more money by selling another one. So it's a completely different um, mindset um, for designers. Um, and we were hoping that we would be able to launch that and scale it. Um, but the costs involved in actually scaling it, because you don't get paid with the subscription model. When you, when you sell it all at once, you get paid for it in dribs and drabs. We just didn't have enough cash when it came to it. Um, we'd modeled that in advance, but the manufacturing costs were higher. So we haven't managed to do that. 
But what we're looking at at the moment is taking the learnings from that with our current supply chain and seeing if there's another way that we can incorporate them. And life cycle is really, really key and having the ability to be able to predict the life of different parts of the bicycle, obviously the frame and forks, but all the components as well is absolutely key. So we're focusing our efforts more on that end of thing at the moment. So watch this space. We, we do hope to be able to do something more. Take the learnings from a project that on the face of it initially failed. You know, yeah. we tried and we did. It, it failed in the, the way that we'd initially conceived it. But we're, we're seeing what we can do with that in a different way now. But it's better to try and then you know, sort of find out what, you know, it helps channel, you know, channel possible further actions yeah. because you can, root, you can rule out, OK, that didn't work. We know that didn't work. What did work and how do we go forward from here? And, and you know, again, like that's something that I think the whole industry is going to have to start dealing with because we need to have more repairable things that last longer, that have less environmental impact so that cycling is, as you said, the environmentally friendly activity that on the surface level it looks like but it needs to be the whole way through from production to well the end point of the product which shouldn't really be the end point of the product should be you know the point of of evolving it into something something new hopefully yeah um, and just just on that i think the key to that is collaboration across the industry <clears throat> it's it's too big a thing for mm, an individual yeah. brand to solve so just put that out there if anybody's listening and want to contact us or share ideas and thoughts um, it's going to be about sharing and collaborating. Dom's put his hand up there, so I feel like we've already got connections being forged here. And yeah, and again, if anyone has any questions or, or around that, don't forget to pop them in the chat, and we'll we'll um, we'll bring those up in the in the chat at the end. Um, and just before we finish, <coughs> but we will be coming back to you again. Um, what's what kind of projects are you working on now? So I feel like you've 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 got children's bikes covered. What other projects are you working on? Are you staying with that or are you evolving? Um, we, we launched a range of bikes for um, elderly people a few years ago, two or three years ago. Um, and we are also about to launch a range of bikes for people with dwarfism. So we've been working with the Dwarf Sports Association for a good couple of years now on that project. And we're really pleased that that's, yeah, we're about to launch that next month. So you heard it here first. Um, and I think the theme for us is there's there's lots of there are really big brands out there doing really good job on um, bicycles for mainstream people. But there are um, groups of people that the mainstream industry ignores. And that's really where we're focusing our efforts. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so watch this space and we'll sort of flag up how you can follow what Isla is working on. Actually, one more question. Um, you're probably through your work um, with Isla Bikes, probably one of the most well-known um, women involved in bike design. And hope, you know, we're seeing more and more women coming into it, which is brilliant. Um, what do you, do you think that that sort of has an effect on, on bike design, different perspectives coming in, different experiences coming in? What, what impact can that have on bike design in general and the evolution of bike design for the market as a whole? It builds on my previous answer, really, Aoife. Um, the, the bicycle industry, from a designer point of view, has um, been um, dominated by a very, very narrow group of people, um, white males, uh, for so many years. And um, whatever, however well-intentioned those individuals are, that, that narrowness of experience means that there are um, groups of people who just aren't really registering on the radar. So um, I think more people with different characteristics coming into bicycle design and, and women would be um, representative of that will mean that eventually that more people are catered for better. And that's just, that's a good thing. More diversity is always More good. diversity throughout the whole industry at every level, yeah. definitely. So yeah, let's, let's keep working towards that. Um, Isla, thank you very much. We're gonna come back to you in a minute. Let's move on to Dom, who's clearly itching to get into some of the questions here because you've I know that you're going to have lots to, to contribute to this one Dom um let's kick off Dom with um your background so make Dom uh, Mason Mason cycles we can see your amazing workshop in the background I'm pretty sure you didn't set up the question in advance so that you had your bike ready in the background for just to, to wheel that in or is that is that you know have you got have you... always there uh, like that <laughs> always prepared um <laughs> Dom, your background is in, in mountain biking. Um, 
but if we're looking around the sort of bikes in the background, you've got quite a variety of different bikes in the, in the Mason um, stable. Yeah. How did your background in mountain biking affect your approach to design? And, and what would be your definition of bike design? What's the Mason ethos to bike design? Um, shall I start with the bike design? Yeah, let's go with bike design first. And then as, um, as, as Isla said and you said earlier, uh, the what is bike design question is kind of huge. And um, it, it, um, it, it made me think about it when you asked that question. Uh, and, and I think it's just, you know, it's joining a human being to wheels uh, so they can propel themselves along. If you look at it at a super basic level. Um, and there are so many ways of doing that. And human beings are so many different shapes. Um, and as Isla brilliantly um, realized uh, with children, um, that bicycles, all the, you know, joining that little human being to the wheel so they could propel themselves along wasn't in the design brief of bikes for children before Isla did that. And everything was in the wrong place. The handlebars were too high up. The pedals weren't in a place where you could even push them. Uh, you couldn't pull the brakes. The seat wasn't in the right, you know. So it, if you look at that example, I suppose bike design is joining that human being to wheels, but doing it in a, um, you know, doing it in a, a way that makes that efficient. And mm -hmm. there are so many different um, types of cycling and, and human being shapes and, um, you know, flexibility of people in the, at different ages. It's, it's, it's kind of complicated. So, and, and we've already said that we all do it, our, our different thing. Um, and what I like about it is it's, it's super personal because mm. I think if you, even if you design a car, which is a very complicated machine, there's, there's really only one car size to fit everybody and you just get in and <laughs> slide the seat back. And so what I've always enjoyed about the bike design is it instantly make a connection with your customer because you, they almost straight away talk to you about their you know, their stiff back or, um, you know, their inside leg measurement or whatever. So it's, it's super personal already. And then you build your way from there. And that's, that's only one part of it, you know. And then also, as I mentioned, there's all the different tubes, the wall thicknesses, the components, the wheels, the tires, the clearances, the, what that bike can be used for. It's, it, it's a huge subject, but fundamentally, it's just moving that person efficiently and making them love that thing. You know, it's not the, the brilliant thing about going back to Isla's thing was that at, at that level, you need that person to love that thing because if they just don't get it and they kind of hate it and the mum gets frustrated because why can't the kid ride that bike or stop, you know, yeah. it's going to be okay skateboarding then. So it, it's a fundamental thing that put, you have to kind of love what you're doing and that starts right from there and, it, and, and I think yeah sorry go ahead oh no, I was going to say I mean I think looking at the images there you can you know they really encapsulate that pure joy that I think is something that we all like we all know and everyone who's ridden a bike and really found the right bike for them can you know you see those pictures and you know that feeling like deep inside straight away we've all had that but yeah. I think we've also all had friends who've like had a bad experience or like you know got on the bike and you're heartbroken for them because you're like I want you to have this yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's oh if only you'd like come with me and I'll you know I'll we'll get you on a good bike and yeah. that can make all the difference absolutely and, and and also even for experienced riders on that good bike yeah. that they're going to be in that situation at some point or other where they are you know maybe out of their depth they're suffering they've pushed themselves quite hard and if you kind of thinking about the bike too much or you a bit niggled by it it could be the difference between uh finishing something or giving up or just having a really bad time so you 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 know i, I really feel that lo really loving and feeling at one with your bike and actually i always say if a rider says to me oh i didn't really think about the bike that's like great because you're not supposed to think about the bike. Um, 
And I, I think that, that that's, a tr that's a difficult thing about the bike design. It's kind of easy to throw something together and join that human to wheels, but um, to make it so they're not thinking about the bike and just enjoying the riding, that, mm. that's a tricky bit. So you bring, I mean, we know from talking to Isla and I know from talking to yourself that you, you, the, you know, bike designers is a bike designer, you bring a lot of yourself into what you're designing. You're influenced a lot by your own experiences and your own uh, desires and interests and that connection with the rider. So what, what would you say were your influences that have inspired your approach to bike design and, and how has that manifested? Um, well, I think you, you asked about mountain biking mm. and that, and it was, well, because mountain biking, well, we, all, we always made our own bikes. So there wasn't mountain biking. So we, we would always be riding forests and, um, we'd have to make our bike to do that. And we, um, you know, go trail riding when maybe trail riding wasn't a thing uh, and make our bikes out of 10 speed racers. So that's kind of where I started from. And then, and me. yeah, <laughs> then all of a sudden, um, I remember seeing, a, I think it must've been a muddy fox, like a yellow muddy fox. And then I saw someone that had one and it was like, oh my God, what? is that what it just looked like wow that's an incredible thing and in the uk we were pretty i think we were pretty behind um and so i remember i i bought my girlfriend's brother's bike off him and it was a ridgeback and um he was probably nearly six foot so it was it was probably, I don't know what it was, 58 centimetre bike or something. And um, I tried, I've, that was my first mountain bike. And it was, it was great, uh, but it was, I'm only five foot six or something. So it's way, way too big. Um, and then I saw Kona and Kona was like, wow, look at that. Because it's a super different looking mountain bike frame. And it looked a bit like that actually, <laughs> sloping top tube. Um, quite a small rear triangle. So I thought, right, because I've always made my own bikes, I'm going to get this ridge back. And I sawed it up and I re-welded the top tube at a slope and I dropped the seat stays down and I brazed them back on and uh, repainted it and kind of made myself a Kona. And, <laughs> and it was great and it lasted and it rode really well. And it must have, because it, it had a long wheelbase, but it was a small bike. It was all of a sudden, it was like quite mm -hmm. new school. And um, so that was kind of just what we did. It wasn't like, you know, un unusual. Um, I can't remember the question now, but that's, that's probably, so it's always been <laughs> in me to just sort of make things. Yeah. Um, and then um, I, out the back of our house were fields and we used to work on the farm and we grew up working on the farm and so the whole culture of farming is you just fix things and make things if you need something you make it um and if something breaks you fix it you don't necessarily have to buy something new so that that was there as well and i i won't go on too much but then i ended up <laughs> teaching engineering to um agricultural students so um and i ended up teaching fabrication and design and welding um and also hydraulics and pneumatics and a lot of first principle stuff like that. Um, and I did that for quite a long time. Um, and then my brother also, he started a, a bicycle company, which was um, called DMR Bikes in those days. And that was the, the early, very early days of dirt jumping in the UK. And he made a pretty good success of that. And then a few years on, I was still teaching engineering and he said, oh, we, we've been offered this, these carbon fiber forks to sell in the UK from a company called Kinesis, um, who are a massive Taiwanese bike brand, but just um, servicing other bike brands at that point. They'd seen Giant, they wanted to start their own bike brand. And so, but they were starting with forks, which at that time, a carbon fiber fork was, for a road bike was quite a thing. Mm. And so I said, oh, okay. Well, I'll give that a go then. So I, he asked me to come along and, and help them. And that, that's kind of where it started. Because selling forks turned out to be 
difficult. So I said, why don't we design a frame to go on the fork and sell it to shops as a frame of fork? You know, um, and I designed this probably quite awful road frame, but um, it, it, it worked and people bought it. And, um, and then from then on, I, I designed more and more frames and they, they seemed to be a success. And, I, and my mountain biking background came into that. And then looking back at it, I think my kind of almost naivety and lack of, almost lack of reverence for the big cycling, road cycling brands. Mm. Um, but only looking back at it, I realized that that probably paid off because I didn't have any preconceived ideas about what I should do or the rules of mm. road cycling. Because it, it's always felt like, um, or people say that sort of, you know, road cycling is very traditional, very like hi historical, very, um, yeah, tradition based and, and I can't think of the word, but sort of classic in, classic in its approach to bike design. And you can see sort of like the, um, uh, the reticence in the uptake of things like disc brakes, <laughs> like, no, we're yeah, not having disc yeah. brakes. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if you've if you come from a mountain biking background, you're like, yeah, disc brakes are brilliant. Like, why not disc brakes? Yeah, and it was totally that. And, it, you know, yeah. um, I remember I, I thought, right, cyclocross, that looks mad. Why don't we, <laughs> I, why don't we have a go at doing a cyclocross bike? And, and I was like, I looked at, um, I think I looked at an Allen frame, which were kind of like, oh, people don't usually look at an Allen because mm. they're, the, they're the ones. And I was like, this is terrible. Why would I, why, would, why is that? So I just thought, right, I'm going to make it with big tubes, big clearance, a um, bit more mountain bike geometry. Surely this has got to be a thing to do because I just, maybe if I, maybe if I had more kind of, I don't know, I don't know if it's the right word, but kind of like reverence for that brand or where it had come from or the whole thing you were supposed to struggle with, almost like a road frame in the mud. I, I would have just thought, oh, we better do it like that. But I just thought, well, that, that doesn't look right. Let's do it like this. And, and then the same thing is kind of applied almost all the way through um, my bike design. If I look back at it. Yeah. So it's that combination of like your experience as a rider, your kind of, yes, yeah, so you're just coming in with fresh eyes and going, well, here's a problem. And you're that sort of like your, your skills and, and background meaning, well, I, I could make something that would fix this problem. I'm just going to do it. Yeah. Um, what so Mason is beautiful bikes. Um, but you know, if we're talking about, we've been talking about other huge brands like Giant or whatever. Like compared to those, quite small. What yeah. are the advantages and disadvantages of, of of running a smaller brand in that way? Um, well, I think the, the advantages certainly are that we can be agile. Um, and, you know, and, and pretty flexible. Um, and we, I mean, I've, we'll, we'll probably talk about it later, but I've never believed in, you know, model years and all that almost marketing contrived mm. industry stuff. Um, and we do things when we think it's right or when I think, oh, that looks like something's emerging there. Let, let's do something. Or if I just have an idea or a hunch, we're not big on market research, to be honest, but um, we are quite big on being uh, heavily involved in, the, you know, in, in cycling from supporting riders, to grassroots and right, everybody that works here is a rider. Um, and so we can move quite fast. And so if I think, okay, I just think that that's gonna be something that people are gonna want. Um, well, that, that could be, I can see that something emerging I'll, I'll kind of get on it. And, um, and in that way, somehow we, we've managed to find ourselves at, at the front of things quite mm. a lot. And, um, you know, it, I, I remember people, uh, when we did our Boca gravel bike, it was almost, there was only two similar sort of products. Um, and it, it was quite, it was like, wow, okay, that's quite a surprise. But it's, I think we've done it by, yes, by being small, but also the people that we um, have in our community or the people, the riders that we know, we're able to listen to them really closely. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Josh, one of our riders, it, he, he called me from the desert in Mexico once and he said, I think I'm, 
I think I've got to the limit of this gravel bike now. You know, I've, I've overloaded it and I'm in this deep sand. And I was like, okay, well, let, let's think of the next thing then. And so we did. And it's often worked like that. And so that, that, that's the way that we work. But I think you mentioned the pitfalls. And um, because to be like that, you have to be on the sharp <laughs> bit. You know? So we, I feel like we're on the sharp bit. And being on this big, round, safe bit is, is safe. Because <laughs> it means you can't, you can get it quite wrong and you don't fall off the edge. But with, with being on here, if I feel like, okay, if Don's hunch just wasn't right and we've plowed everything into it and there's only six of us, but if Dom's hunt was right, we could quite easily just fall off because this sharp bit at the front, or hopefully near the front, is it, it is a tough place to be. So it uses a lot of energy. But on here, safe, but maybe invisible and boring. So I don't know. Would you say that, so, so innovation is very much part of what you're doing. So innovation, understanding of the brand, uh, sorry, of the standing of the market and close connection with your riding community. Um, you could just play it safe. So what drives that is from your point of view, is it curiosity? Is it wanting to satisfy needs? Is it a blend of the two? Is it just that you just love building and creating bikes? That's, it's a good question. <clears throat> it's probably not any one thing. I think, hmm. I, I think if I, if I think about it, what, what really drives me is, is maybe I'm, I'm watching something. I think, God, I just, if, if they just, if they just had that, if they had this type mm. of bike or we just did this, then what could those riders do on that bike? And I think that for me, <laughs> that is the fundamental of it. That if I, I want to, I want to see my idea mm. um, and get that, get those bikes under people and see what they can do with those bikes. And, um, you know, and I think for me, that, that is um, what I love is that people do say, my God, I got that bike. And they, and they, it might sound a bit grand, but they do say, and it, and it really, it, it changed my life. And you think, oh, but then they, it, it really has. <clears throat> they'll tell you where they've gone and they got lost you know they, they bought a bike for commuting and then and they've ridden across Scandinavia or something and um yeah so I, th I think fundamentally it's just like having that idea thinking I would like to get that machine yeah. under people to see what they can do with it yeah. um and then you know and and then I put myself through the whole thing of uh, taking an idea from an idea to getting underneath people and it's, you know, it's quite a journey. But um, yeah, I think you have to really, I don't know, I, I, I think it, it is so hard that you have to have a passion for it. And um, I wouldn't want to, I don't think I could have kind of um, carried on yeah. if it was just doing it for you know from the point of view of a spreadsheet you know yeah if it was just we were doing 699 99 things and we had to just market them to people yeah. it's too hard that that wouldn't work for me so it can only be that I, that I want to see what people can do with the bikes yeah I think that's something that's definitely coming across talking to Isla and yourself and I'm sure this is going to come across with Neil as well is that it's that underlying love of cycling and wanting to share that and give people the best experience. And yeah, I mean, I know it sounds really cliche, but it, it can change your life, mm. um, even in small ways that can have big ripple effects across your whole life. I think, I think that's something that I, you know, I really love about bicycles. And I think that that's something that I think all of our, our bike designers share with that. Um, Neil, we're going to, Dom, thank you for that. We're going to come back to you because there's more questions. There's some questions I haven't asked that I desperately want to ask you as well. Um, but we're going to move on to uh, Neil Sutton now. Um, and Neil, you've uh, brand, I like the, we've got the bike in the background. We've got your Sonda t-shirt on. You're like primed and ready to go. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your fascinating journey through the world of bike design and what, how do you define bike design? Um, to be honest, I think I'll struggle to sum up as well as Isla. Um, I, I would say for me, it's a bit of a problem-solving exercise. So um, 
we always, when we were looking to introduce a new bike, we start with intended purpose and obviously target audience. Um, and from there, you sort of plot out, right, we want this much suspension travel, this wheel size, this tyre size. Um, and then it's sort of putting together the puzzle. So getting the, the frame numbers right so all the bits fit where they should fit um, and the bike rides as intended. Um, so a lot of back and forward with factories, fine-tuning designs, uh, a bit of trial and error, um, and then just testing, really, you know, getting the samples out, getting out and ride. Um, obviously, the fun part of the job, really, getting to um, uh, ride on work's time, get paid for it. <laughs> Sounds terrible. I don't know, I don't know how, you, how you cope with that one. In that part of the process, like, what does it feel like when you, when you sort of like you finally get that first iteration of the bike that you've designed and you get to take it out like what does that feel like yeah, new bike day is, is you, know, you think it'd wear off because it happens so often but i do really enjoy new bike day um <laughs> and i think what in the last month i've had three new bikes so it's it's uh yeah it happens quite a lot um but yeah it's yeah it's definitely still an exciting thing for me so yeah getting the frame out giving it a good once over and then um trawling the warehouse, some nice bits to bolt to it usually, or breaking down old uh, sample bikes and, and getting it back together. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, you, you've got to, like, and for me, I, I, I want to be the one to ride the bikes. I, you know, I, I've sort of, in my head, I know what I want it to feel like. Uh, so with all of our bikes, apart from, to be honest, the road bikes, because that's not my area of expertise at all, um, I do get out and ride myself. Um, and then the road bikes, I've got a few guys in on, on our staff at the office that uh, that do ride quite regular and have a lot of experience in that area. Rob being one, he's one of my uh, head road bike testers. Yeah, and we know that we've just made quite a lot of people in the audience quite jealous of you there, Neil, with your like yeah. bike access. Um, how many iterations then do you go through for like, because presumably I'm guessing like the first frame you get probably does it need more work or do you know do you, have you ever gone bingo this is it doesn't need anything else doing yeah to like sometimes um i think I, i've never gone more than three before hitting production um so i usually get the first one in and i sort of sometimes know in the back of my head that um i want to try this but it might not be quite right so mm -hmm. i'll um i'll sort of stick my stick my neck out a little bit give it a go um, and then sometimes I'll dial it back to where I thought it should be somewhere. Sometimes I'm going to go sort of halfway back. Um, so it is, it's, it, as I say, it's trial and error. Um, there has been a few bikes that have just been first time like win, um, but not many. It's not, it's not every day that you get a, um, a first time sample turn up and it's, it's perfect straight away. There's always a couple of milli error there, half a degree error there. It's yeah. A bit of fine tuning. And how did you, like, at what point in your cycling journey did you go, like, do you know what, I, I want to design bikes. Was it fairly early on or is it? Um, um, to be honest, I didn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my, my career progression has been um, a bit of an odd one, really. Um, sort of, I suppose, meeting the right people at the right time um, and just going with it. So, like, my history is I, um, I was doing IT at college uh, while I was working in a bike shop part-time as a mechanic really fell out of love with IT, just not the most exciting thing. Um, so when I finished the course, I like, right, I'll just go full-time in bike shop until I sort of find something I want to do. Um, and to be honest, the time in the bike shop probably did serve me well, because I think in the seven years I was there, I had about 16 bikes. Um, so I rode pretty much everything, and there were always demo bikes coming in from manufacturers. Um, and I just, yeah, I just sort of tried to, try everything you know from downhill bikes dirt jump bikes um obviously early days cyclocross bikes before gravel was a thing um and yeah from there moved into a working for a brand as a mechanic um did that for a couple of years moved around a few departments at that company um worked a bit with the designer there helping sort of product testing um definitely i did get a bit of input on a few of the new, mo new models that came through in my time. Um, and then for my last couple of years there, I was managing the workshop. Uh, so man just looking after bike assembly, a team of 12, 13, 14 guys um, at our peak, sort of putting out 400 bikes a week. Um, I wouldn't say I was 
really, really happy in the job. I, I was sort of still looking for something. Um, and that's when uh, our boss, David Hanny, CEO of Outkit, um, previous CEO of place I was at before, um, got in touch with him and said, we're launching a bike brand. Um, and he, he didn't say, do you want a job? He said, do you know anyone who wants a job? So I'm like, um, me, me. <laughs> so um, I, I sort of came into Outkit um, to look after Sonda. Um, the initial job was sort of just look after the day-to-day, not the design part of it. Um, back then, we did have an external designer, Brad Richards, um, who, you know, UK industry, quite quite a big name. Um, and he did the original three Sonda designs, um, at the time, he had other business interests getting quite quite busy. So um, he sort of stepped back and we sort of stopped hearing from him, from him a little bit. Uh, so when when that happened, we realised, right, we need someone to do this. Uh, Dave's like, oh, who, sh- who should we get? And I'm like, I'll, I'll give it a pop. I reckon I, I might, be able to, might be able to do this. Um, and six years later, I've still got a job. So... You're doing um, something right there, Neil. Yeah, that, that's that's it. It's like I say, it's um, it's pro- probably not the story most people expect, but yeah, it's that's the way it happened. But I think that's also lovely to hear as well, though, that there's not like one set route to do anything. It's like, no, you've got to go and do this course and then this course and then this. Like it's it's you know, there's so many different routes. And again, I guess it goes back to that whole point that. Everyone has a different experience, comes with a different yeah. perspective, and you bring that into to what you're building, which I, I think is lovely. Like it means that, you know, we might have prospective, you know, sort of bike designers in the audience listening to that who are like, well, actually, you know, I, I could go into this now. It's something I've always yeah. been interested in. I never thought about it before, but maybe, maybe this is what what I could do, which I think is fantastic. I probably won't be doing that myself, but I'm quite happy to, you know, ride the bikes that you guys design. So we'll just go with that. Um, so some, you know, like all the, the bikes that we're talking about here tonight, um, you know, sort of a British bike design, does, does coming from their British perspective, and I guess I'm talking, you know, potentially talking about like weather, terrain, that kind of thing, um, does that affect how you approach bike design? It definitely does. Um, the, just the basics are, are one thing, like like you say, with the weather. Um, I used to hate getting bikes that were designed out in California when I went to the bike shop that had exposed section of gear cable. It's like, why? There's no good reason. An extra bit of gear out away is nothing. So um, I, I used to, literally every bike I ever had that ex- had exposed section of cable, you know, whatever it were, it could have been a three grand trek. I, I had a couple of DMR trail stars actually back in the day, um, but they all got the um, gear cabling ripped off and a full out of zip tied front to back. <laughs> it's just, just, just like I said, the basics. And then, um, yeah, decent tire clearance, you know, ability to run a proper tire, not not like a 2.1 uh, semi slick that's still rubbed when it got muddy. Um, and then <clears throat> terrain wise, um, I would say that in this country compared to the rest of the world, um, our trails are what I'd consider more technical, tight and twisty. Even our fast trails aren't fast. They're technical, tight and twisty. Um, We've no sort of alpine descents where you're cracking 50 mile an hour on a downhill bike. Um, And yeah, Jeff, you can do that at Fort William, fair play, because that's a properly bumpy track. Um, But with that, I sort of, I decided to, our bikes, I'd like to say, a design with that in mind. So more of a playful character, you know, sh- short rear ends, um, keep the reach numbers quite sensible. So we don't need crazy, crazy long bikes for super stability when we're you know, topping out at 25 mile an hour every so often. Uh, we need a bike that will get around the corners in between those straight bits because that's where the time is. Um and at the same time, I wouldn't say I make bikes for racers. Um, most people don't race. Most people ride on a weekend, uh, Sunday morning, then get home and do have family time with, with the kids. Um, and I think our bikes suit that sort of rider perfectly in that they are sort of a... Um, they're just quite a neutral geometry, like neutral sizing, um, nothing crazy long. Um, yeah, I don't really know how to sum it up. Yeah. 
yeah, versatile and robust. But I mean, it sort of comes back to that whole thing that I think we can get carried away with when you're looking at bikes. Like, oh yeah, I want this latest thing that you know I could totally ride an enduro one. It's like realistically, am I going to yeah. be riding an enduro when my local trail is, yeah, you know, fairly flat and you know, a long travel enduro bike is not going to be the most uh, that, fun to ride on that. That is definitely one of my pet peeves. Is um, you go to a trail centre and 95% of the bikes have got 106, 170 mil of travel. Um, yeah. When a 120, 130 bike is just the absolute ticket for a job like that. Yeah. And so playful and fun and poppy. Yeah. yeah. I'm, a, yeah. I'm a big fan of, of shorter travel bikes. Yeah. Not number um, of But Sonder also do offer um, a degree of customization in, in, in some of their frames as well. Um, why offer that and what kind of things do people go for? Um, to be honest, I think we just offer it because we can. Um, we work with a quite a good titanium frame factory uh, that's more than happy to do as one-offs. Um, and it is only in titanium. Um, and it, you know, we can do pretty much anything. Um, a lot of it is just tweaks to current designs. So people who, they, they want one of our off-the-peg frames, but actually they want the seat tube off a medium with the reach off an XL. Um, and just mixing and matching bits like that. Um, we do you know, odd things like pinion fat bikes, and a few of those. Um, there's the bike behind me, which is my own personal titanium dirt drum bike. Um, and then we've done a few monster cross bits of bobs, so gravel bikes, but with 2.4 inch tires and suspension forks. Um, yeah, whatever anyone wants, really. Um, we probably do. I think probably average around 20 custom frames a year. Um, and they're nice little projects a lot of them. Some people do get in touch, sort of <clears> seeing what's possible, and then they end up going away and just ordering a stock frame because they you know, once you talk through what difference the changes they've asked for will actually make, it's like, well, you're not really achieving anything. <laughs> the the, the, the off-the-peg frame is is the right frame for the job. Um, so yeah, it's it's, it's quite a fun part of the job to be honest it's additional to my day to day just that yeah. getting, getting the odd strange request through yeah, a nice little extra project to get your teeth into yeah, yeah. Um, and another angle that we've, we've sort of talked a bit with with Isla as well is, is the environmental impact of bikes because you know Sonda being part of Alpkit that's something that um, I know that Alpkit are, are very aware of as a brand the yeah. environmental of their, impact of their products um, you know, so longevity of their products, repairability of their products as well. How does that approach manifest in, in Sonda? Um, so design-wise, um, you probably notice is there's quite a lack of carbon in our, in our range of frames. Um, at the minute, obviously, carbon recycling, it is slowly becoming a thing, but it's slowly. Um, and it's going to be a while until it's a, quite an easy thing to do. Um, but on, off the back of that as well, with carbon, you can't really do You pay a fortune for a set of carbon molds for some frames, and that's it. You, know, you, you can't then go and tweak the seat angle a little bit, or you know, as sort of trends move around, you can't be that reactive with a, with a carbon frame. Uh, whereas, obviously, working with aluminium, steel, uh, and titanium, we can sort of incrementally change bits of obs you know, with every batch if we want to, just to keep the the bike's current um on top of that as well parts um i like to think we fit parts that are fit for purpose fit for intended purpose and then they're, they're the right parts like they're, they're the parts that well the way i look at it is I, i'd spec a bike how i would want it um and uh, not that i'm the most amazing rider but I, I sort of know what works and i know what i like um, not saying everyone should like what I like, um, but yeah, we try and put a bike together so that when you're taking out the box, you're not taking bits off a bin of them. Um, just yeah, just fitting good solid kit out of the box is a is a big part of it. Um, we also have a code of conduct um, for our suppliers, uh, so it's it's not a super long document, but it's definitely something that we when we approach a new factory, uh, we go through with them and sort of check the boxes and it's it just covers the basics so you know, something you don't really see anymore but like child labor um you know, fair pay which is still a bit of an issue in some some factories in china um and it becomes really obvious when you after chinese new year you see a drop in quality on a batch of frames um 
again, it's it's all it's all a little bits like that, which we are super keen that um, the guys that are making our bikes are tread well, fair pay, health and safety is up there, um, and then obviously we do look at their environment environmental impact. Um, so yeah, we're, we're pretty keen on on that front, I'd say. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you talk about, yeah, the, the, the sort of corporate ethics side of things as well, but also, f- you know, you have power as a as a brand there to encourage change further back up the, the chain as well, yeah. as well as sort of outwards and down to your customers. So that's, yeah, it's a really interesting, interesting perspective on things. And um, in terms of your customers as well, so if, um, and the, the sort of wider cycling community, does Sonda get involved with, so the environmental and the ethics side of of that, so the you know diversity side of cycling, we definitely do. Um, it's definitely something that we do promote. Um, I know in our marketing, we do um, try and use a diverse group of riders. Uh, don't mix it up, sort of get that sort of inclus- inclusive outlook, I suppose. Um, but yeah, and obviously we put on at the minute we've got the gravel series going on, the Sonda gravel series which is huge and like over a hundred riders at each event, all walks of life, all riding bikes, all have a big smile on the faces. Um, so yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, right, question time. Um, we've had loads of questions coming in, which is fantastic. Um, if you do want to ask any questions, you can either specify to who you want to ask a question or I'm just going to ask it to everybody. We'll see how many we can get through. Um, but yeah, do do send them in. We we have got we've got loads. This is brilliant. So let's go for the first one. Isla, this is from Liam Mercer. What is your process for testing bikes for kids, and how do you decide decide on the final design? Um, the um, because concept for the design will come from observing children <coughs> riding what we do already. Um, and spotting opportunities for improvements, just like Don said. So a lot of observation. Um, And very often that's not uh, a planned event. It's just somebody seeing something. So it might be a customer that's trying a bike with us for the first time. We might be um, um, on a Sustrans path and notice something, or we might be at an event watching children racing. Um, And it's... it depends on the age of the child, but we would get um, to a sample stage, just as Neil said, and then and then try it out, try it out with children, and again observe and watch and ask questions. But particularly with children, the observation bit is really important. Um, yeah, rather than the um, the asking them what they want. I mean, obviously you do both, but but observation and observe with empathy. Ah, observe with empathy I love that that's brilliant and um, okay we've got one for you Neil from Tim Noyce how far do you think the long low and slack movement will go do you think we're approaching the pinnacle of bike design and he rides a Sonda Cortex I, I definitely do think it's sort of starting to come back um the you know, the crazy long reach numbers the super steep seat angles um they don't suit the everyday rider they probably suit a World Cup endurance rate, enduro racer, um, but for, an, for the everyday rider, you're much better off on a, you know, a, it's funny to say he rides a Cortex, that's probably my favourite bike, um, and in a medium, that's a 435, no, well, 440 reach uh, with a 74 and a half seat angle, so by today's standards, quite conservative numbers, um, but it's just perfect for what most people do on a bike, I think. Um, so, yeah, I do think um, with the big brands, you're going to see reach numbers come back down, see angles creep back to sort of 74, 75 area, um, just because for your everyday rider, it's, it, it's the right thing to do, I'd say. Um, Don, we've got one from you from James Lumley. Would you consider going into fat bikes at any point, having mentioned seeing riders get to a bike's limitation? Um, no. um there is certainly a place for for a fat bike but there's never going to be a mason fat bike and um i think um i just think a a lot of it is because um i always like to design you know design a thing that i see myself riding and i really believe in fat bikes for certain conditions um and you know maybe sand and snow 
And I, I kind of also think that a fat bike is fun if everyone's got a fat bike. If you're the only guy on it, maybe sure. maybe it's it's not quite as fun. And I do know, well, my I'm you know my experience is limited in fat bikes, but I do know if you hurl them into a corner, they do let go remarkably fast, and you lose the bike. So low ground pressure is a great thing, um, but I don't know. It, you know, it, it, it's a bike for a purpose, and uh, it's not something that you will see from Mason. Sorry. Okay, okay. <laughs> Concise answer there. Thank you for that. So no fat bikes from Mason. No. Probably. Um, so we've got a good one from Hayley Dow for everybody. So we'll go with Dom first of all, and then I'll ask, ask you around. Um, how long does it take roughly to go from a basic sketch con uh, concept to first prototype? Dom, how long does it take um, to well, I tell you what, Tom's got all the props ready to go. I, had, I thought I'll put these here. So I kind of always oh. start with, it, it looks a bit rubbish and the geometry is terrible, but I always, if I'm thinking about something, I have to get it down onto paper and then I, and I sketch all over it and draw all over it. And you can see that we've got a bike called the insert of all the ISO and that was where it started. Um, with that, just getting everything out of my head onto a bit of paper. So, um, you know, some 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 people probably most people use um, CAD straight away, but I always sketch it straight away because I find it gets it gets all my ideas directly onto paper in a much more fluid way. So I, I always start there. Um, I you know for us it. Probably 18 months, I would say. It sounds a long time, but it, it it's um it's because we we always get um, quite a lot of prototypes, and then we ask a lot of people to ride them. And I'm a crazy obsessive person about detailing, getting everything perfect, and um, it just takes a long time. So. Yeah, but that, the ISO took probably about that amount of time. The mountain bike we've just take, done took a huge amount of time. Um, and I'm, it is, you know, it's difficult to say, but for us, it, I would say that was about 18 months. About 18 months. Yeah. Isla, how long for, for an Isla bike? Or, or well, it's difficult, isn't it? Because we've got so many different types of well, they're all Isla bikes. audiences. Yeah. yeah. Um, it depends. <laughs> um, if it if it's um, being built by a, a factory in Southeast Asia, then um, I'm, currently things are really slow, as everybody knows. But um, it, it might be something between, so from drawing to first prototype, somewhere between um, six to eighteen months, depending on various things. Um, but we do also build prototypes in-house so we have frame building capability and facility here in Ludlow um, and the dwarfism range of bikes that we're launching next month the first prototypes of those from concept to prototype done in about three weeks um, we were able to we were able to make the frames ourselves um, and the a lot of the components because we have our own tiny components for children's bikes we were able to to be purpose for the first prototypes for that project so yeah enormously different speedy and neil what about for Sonda? Ah, <laughs> yeah yeah neil had a what about for Sonda? how how quickly do you go from concept sketch to to first prototype um, you it obviously depends on um what it is you know, aluminium frames steel frames you know, time frames do vary um i would say in a normal world, we could probably get, you know, have the conversation about an idea, get some get some numbers down on paper, um, and we could probably have a frame landed in about four months for a first sample. Um, obviously, double that if if we if we go again. Um, at the minute, as Isla says, it is shockingly slow. Um, so uh, yeah, I've I've got a steel frame in the pipeline that. I've been working on about three or four months now, and I've still not seen. You know, I've not even seen a final, you know, the exact spec that I want to get out of the factory. Um, it's just little bits at a time, and then the three weeks in between contact, chase, 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 um, and yeah, it's it's slow going at the minute. 
Neil, while I have you, I've got a question from Mike Tickle, who'd like to know, any plans for a Sonder EMTB? There is, there is. Um, <laughs> so last year we suffered a bit of a blow. Uh, one of our factories closed their doors um, and we did have a final drawing ready to go for an e-bike with them. Um, but because they've closed the doors, we've had to resource. Um, that affected the Evol and Cortex frames as well. So I've got samples arriving before the end of this month of revised Evol and Cortex from a new factory. Um, once I've got those through, it's a factory we've not worked with before. So once I've got those through and we've seen quality of finish um, and had a good look at them, then we're going to start work on the e-bike again. Um, so I'm open to have a sample sort of by summer, really, um, with a view to launch probably next year, early next year. If you need help testing that, like I'm always happy to. I, I've never properly rode an e-bike, so I'm really excited <laughs> to test the hell out of it. Right. We'll, we'll look out for that. We'll, we'll sort of be watching your your, uh, your social media and see what yeah, You'll see that all the KMs, I get up all the hills. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're supposed to turn it off for that. But... <laughs> um, I've got a, another question that, um, that I'd quite like to ask all of you, which is, is to do with... Um, the feedback from the communities you get when you're riding. So, so Dom, I know that you um, you support quite a lot of um, you. You've got quite a lot of uh, riders that you support. The Mason Cycle supports, and you've had a lot of riders. You've had riders do events like things like GB Juro, um, and a lot of women riding on your. You know, you quite a good split with um, men and female riders as well, which is yeah. probably more than the industry average for for that kind of thing. How important is that kind of feedback from a design point of view and just from a brand point of view to, su to support riders and communities? Um, well, it's, fu it's fundamental to Mason. And um, right from the start, um, I was supporting a, my friend, uh, Josh Ibbitt, um, and uh, he won the TCR in 2015 on, on one of my first bikes. And it was a, like a, it was a pivotal point for us. And, and since then, we've we've always um, been super keen on supporting riders um, and really you know that the female riders that we support have um, have been first of all they've they've been people that have come along and chosen to ride our bikes and we've just made a connection and seen something in them and decided to, to help them out um, and we've continued in that way and we only have a very small group of supported riders, but it is 50-50 split. And, um, you know, in, interestingly, the, you know, you, you're mentioning the, the female rider thing because, and when we were talking about this talk, um, it made me start to think about female designers. And, you know, we're super lucky to have either one here, um, who is, you know, a, a, an absolute inspirational designer for me. Um, um, but something that you, you mentioned, the GB Juro, and last year's GB Juro was striking because it was, it was almost exactly 50-50 split of the, of the starters. Um, and something that we mentioned right at the start of the talk was, you know, um, that we really hope to see an increase in the, um, in the amount of female bike designers because that will really bring something to the industry and this type of riding if we're going to talk about the gb duro which is in like an ultra endurance type of riding a bike packing ultra endurance um it's not about brute strength and so it's really leveling and it, it really is there's a lot of um belief and willpower involved and i really believe that, that that's why we're, we're seeing female riders do so well um, and it, it's something that we kind of started to notice early on and because of that belief thing I think that's why you're seeing it there's 50 50 split because more female riders see that happening they believe they can do it um, and you know it's, it's a brilliant thing to see and no doubt many of those people are brilliant creative people and they love bikes and they'll be riding along thinking about bikes and what could be better about bikes. And, you know, I hope, and I, and I, I believe it to be true that it, we will see more female bike designers because of that, because, you know, there's no reason why males are any better at 
designing things or being creative, but it's just this social expectation thing where, you know, of blokes go and build dirt jumps, don't they? You know, and that's where it starts from and they end up riding bikes and then they end up designing bikes. So, you know, it's going to take a while, but it, it's definitely great to see that type of leveling up. And I think it's interesting that that sort of you, you all of you as, as designers and as brands as well, um, are concerned with that, like want to share that, want to make this sport more diverse, not just in terms of providing good equipment for people to do it, but in terms of also encouraging people to do it, improving representation, supporting more diverse riders in their ambitions yeah. and helping them, you know, providing inspiration, hopefully helping them into the industry as well, because that's where change happens as well, is when people are part of it, they're, you know, involved in it, making the decisions rather than just on the receiving end. You know, that's what we, we kind of want to see. We want to see more Islas, Isla. We want more of you. <laughs> we want more different people. We want, we want this to be, you know, the wonderful, diverse you know, sort of support that it could be, which I, th I think is fantastic. It Isla, what's your... Improve, it can only improve things and it can only mm. enhance yeah. the world of bikes, so, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so we've got loads of questions coming in now. Um, this is a, oh, this is a good one from Adam, Adam Stott. Okay, this is for everyone. I'm going to start with you, Neil, though. <sighs> Tough question. From your own range, if you could only own one bike, which bike would it be? Neil, which bike? Um, well, this one's not in the range, <laughs> so I'd keep that. And then out... I think this is going to be cheating here, isn't it? <laughs> and then out of the range, I would have a Cortex. Um, I think, as I said earlier, it's just the one bike, so you can take it bike park Wales, take it around regular trail centres, out in the peaks, lakes, it's perfect. Um, and the only thing it's not very good at is the one, the thing this one's really good at. Um, so I'd be sorted. Okay, so sort of two, but we'll let you off for that yeah, one. Not in the range. Okay, okay. <laughs> Isla, what about you? Well, given that um, the majority of our bikes are for children and don't fit me, I think I'm, I'm going to slightly change the question um, and, and tell you which one's my favourite one, which is also quite a difficult thing to answer because it's like asking somebody which is their favourite child. <laughs> You're really disloyal to all the others. But I, I, I love our NOC 16, which is our four-year-old's bike the one with the slightly bigger wheels we do smaller ones for children that are physically smaller when they're ready to learn to ride but it's it was yeah it's been my first it was my first love when I launched the business and, and it still is aesthetically I just find it the most pleasing out of all the bikes we do excellent and Dom pick one um I I think it would it would have to be well that, that's my bike there which is the titanium version of our uh Boca. so we, we call it adventure sport bike, but gravel, gravel bike. So um, it's that one just because it's, it's so adaptable. Um, and I've taken it down some, you know, red runs in the Alps um, to commuting to work. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that I love. If I had to have one, because I can chase people on mountain bikes with it and I can ride it fast on the road. Do you, do you get funny looks when you catch people on mountain bikes on that? They're like, I got oh. funny looks. I got funny looks when I was in the French Alps on the on those red and blue runs by the guys with full face helmets and all body armor, and then <laughs> they were going, "The drop bars, the drop bars!" Like, don't go down there. So I, thought, you know, I was like, "No." <laughs> but I did. I did crash a lot and go over the bars and all that kind of thing. But it also it informed me about my next bike design and what I wanted to do with it so you know that's what it, that's what it's all about all a learning process um <laughs> we've got uh oh this is another good one um Cl Clive Coleman would like to know what is the single biggest challenge in frame design anyone want to volunteer to answer that one and um, is it going to be the same for all of you or are you each going to have a different perspective on that Isla what would you say is the single biggest challenge in frame design for you I think I'd probably extend it to, to bike design in general, is that um, so many of the decisions you make about particular characteristics of a frame are interdependent and affect other characteristics of it. So I see it as a, as a 
a series of compromises um, and 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 you're trying to get the sweet spot of the compromise all of the the different compromises um, to work for the intended user and the intended use um, and find that sweet spot for those things and get them all working together so that you don't get one characteristic spot on and mess up another characteristic of the bike in the process so it's holding all that information in your head simultaneously um, for, for each individual each individual bike do you ever have the um this is of a term in writing that's called murder your darlings where you know you, you get so much material and so many ideas and you really love what you've written but you've got a word count so something's got to go and it's really hard to chop something that you've loved to bits is there a design equivalent to that uh, I've never heard, never heard of it applied to writing. Um, I can't think of an example. I, I can imagine it could happen. I can't think of an example where I've had to ditch something that I was really in love with in, in a new concept for a bite and just ditch it all together. I think I've always managed to incorporate what I want to in one way or another. But, You're making yeah. bike design sound less traumatic. Maybe I should, should move well, on. It has its traumatic moments and I'm <laughs> sure Neil and Don will. Um, definitely definitely agree with that yeah, yeah. It, it can be an, it, it, it's a very emotive process and it starts with a, a sort of an itch which is your idea and to, that itch turns into an urge and very often you know you're taking on something that's going to be months of headaches and problems to solve and wrangles with maybe suppliers trying to get them to do what you want and that it can get really painful and really fraught um, and the first prototype comes and most of it's right, but there's something wrong with it and you hate it and you fall out with it and you can't look at it for a week. And, you know, it's, 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 it, is a, it is a really emotional process and you get to the end of it. Sometimes you think, I'm never going through that again. And then you get another itch and you do. But yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a particular breed, I think, or we are, that, to put ourselves through it sometimes. Neil, what's not, your not always that easy. <laughs> Neil, what's your perspective on it? Um, yeah, I fully I agree with what, with what Isla said about sort of the balancing act of getting all you know, all the characteristics you want out of a bike while thinking about clearances of this, that and the other, making sure this will fit there. Um, yeah, all the little bits of the puzzle that you've got to get in. Um, a big frustration for me with bike design at the minute is definitely working with the Far East. Um, it's just painfully slow. Um, and yes, yeah, it'd be so much easier to just walk around the corner, but then obviously we're not set up in this country that we've got this sort of, you know, we've not got to that level with our, our sort of production ability over here, uh, where we have got the, the setups for sampling and pumping out you know, hundreds of thousands of frames a year, really. Um, Do you so, think we'd ever get to that position in the UK where we could churn out those numbers? There's definitely going to be more onshoring. Um, yeah, we are we're looking to onshore our paint. Uh, we're onshore in wheel assembly, um, and yeah, it's that that'll be a progression that yeah, who knows where that'll stop. Maybe there will be a Sonder bike factory in uh, in Nottingham soon. We'll, we'll see. Be cool, excellent. And and Dom, what's what what would you find? What would you say is your single big biggest challenge to to designing bikes or in um, the world of bike design? I think I think I. I always have a strong idea about something and I and visualizing visualization is maybe the easy bit for me and I'm, I um, I'm quite creative and I can work with my hands and I'm an engineer and I love metal and welds and all that kind of thing but my my big challenge is there's say a road bike there are eight sizes okay so I always design maybe the 54 and then I work my way both ways, but numbers and you might be surprised to hear this, but numbers are just not my thing. If, if you ask me to add up, um, you'd be amazed how useless I am at doing it. So that it, it pushes me right to the limit and I get exhausted um, by getting everything right and um, creating that you know, from a 48 to a 62 and making it all work correctly, that is, for me, uh, it's, it's hard. That's, that, that's one of the hardest um, things of my job. 
Um, the Thank metal you. bits and all the other bits, I love it. That bit, yeah, hard. Not so much on the numbers. Yeah. Um, we're running out of time, so I have one more question that I want to ask all of you before I hand back over to Rob. And um, I think it will fit in really nicely because we've talked a lot about sort of the passion that you all have for this and how it's an emotive, um, an emotive you know, sort of career choice, really, uh, and process that you do. So my question is, when you're out, out and about and you see someone go past on one of your bikes, how does that feel? Don, we'll start with you. Um, do you know what? It, it's, um, see, well, since I started, which was probably about with the, with the other brand that my, took on for my brother for Kinesis, um, that was 1999, I think. Um, and I, it is still, I, if I'm in the car with someone or riding, and I see a bike go the other way, I always try and stop them. <laughs> or I go, because I want them to know how they feel about it. And it is always quite exciting to see someone on, on the bike. Um, so that, that, that's, that, that's great. And um, I, hope that, I hope it's always like that. But uh, yeah, because I guess you just, there's, there's relatively few you think out there. And it's just, you just think, wow, someone's riding something that I created. Uh, yeah. that, that, that's a nice feeling yeah brilliant Neil what about you someone goes past on on a Sonder one of the bikes that you've kind of worked up from prototype and taken out and, and perfected how does that yeah. feel I think in six years not counting events I think I've only seen five or six on the trails and I, I'll look from everywhere and it is there's definitely when you see someone on a, a bike that you created it's a weird feeling, definitely like a sense of pride, yeah. like sort of definitely raises a bit of a smile. Um, it does depend which of my mates I'm with because they usually will take the mess. Um, but um, but yeah, I, it's, it's, I, I love seeing it. And I, I do remember I, I met a guy um, out in the peaks at the bottom of Cookgate. Um, he, he, we were going up, he was coming down and he were on a, one of our carbon transmitters. And he spotted that I run a raw aluminium full suspension bike with a black Sonda decal along the bottom of the down tube. So he quickly put two and two together. Um, and yeah, it was just such a nice joke. As soon as he realised, he was just gushing about the bike. He was so happy. Um, and yeah, it's cool. It's, it's nice to get that reaction. Thanks. And Isla, what about you? Um... We've sold a lot of Isla bikes over 15 years and it probably happens more frequently for me and Neil, but it's the best feeling and the thrill of it never goes away. And a bit that we haven't talked about tonight, um, certainly for myself and Dom, and I'm sure it happens for Neil as well, is that there's lots of aspects to this job that aren't bikes. Dom and I both run the businesses as well um, with our colleagues. And there are all sorts of frustrations completely unbike related that go with that. And you can have very much have your head in that. And then when you're out and about and you see one of your own bikes in the wild, it just it makes it all worth it. It's absolutely brilliant. Excellent. Um, thank you all so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you all. Thank you also to everyone who sent in some amazing questions. I'm sorry we didn't get through all of them, but there may be an option with that in a moment. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm going to pass back to Rob. Thank you so much, Aoife. And just, I just want to extend my thanks as well. Dom, Isla, Neil, that's an absolutely uh, wonderful to have heard all of that. Uh, wonderful discussion. And Aoife, thank you for asking the questions so brilliantly. That was, that was absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Um, a couple of things before we all say goodbye. If you want to hear more from uh, Dom in the future, uh, do sign up to his newsletter. There's news coming around new bikes soon. And you can sign up to the Mason newsletter on the bottom of their website. So do go and do that. Um, uh, Neil, if you want to hear more from Neil, um, Neil was recently on a, a, a podcast, Andy Sykes Industry Insider. Uh, you can get that on wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, really insightful. So if you want to hear more from Neil, do, do listen to that. And Isla gave me some very, very exciting news here. Lots of people have talked about supply. But the exciting news from Isla is next week there's stock arriving which many people will be asking about but big celebrations and party poppers going off for that so thank you Isla that's great news um and Aoife thank you so much I've really enjoyed tonight so if you want to hear more from Aoife Aoife's got an amazing uh, podcast Spindrift 
podcast. I really, really, really recommend you listen to it. Hear from adventurers, racers, industry insiders. There's, there's loads going on. Do check that podcast out, it's ace. Um, so, and finally, thank you to everyone who's come along and joined us. It's a long night, an hour and a half to spend with us. Uh, so we're so grateful that you've spent that time with us. I'm grateful for all your questions. And it's nine o'clock. It's been long enough. Look out for us on the next Alpgate Night in. We'll let you know what, what's coming up. But in the meantime, have a lovely evening. Have a lovely week. And thank you ever so much again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Goodbye. Bye, guys. Yes.